Hamilton Arts Council serves arts communities within the Greater Hamilton area and the traditional territories upon which it sits, including Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Glanbrook, Hamilton, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Six Nations of the Grand River. We acknowledge that the area we serve is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Hamilton continues to be home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of the land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. I'm going to hand the session over to Shauna White, who is the Head of Development for the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Hi, Shauna. Hello, good morning. I guess it's afternoon now. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, pleased to be here today. Uh, my name is Shauna White. I'm the Head of Partnerships and Development at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. And while I've only been at the gallery for a short time, having started in February of this year, I have over 30 years of experience in the arts and cultural sector. During that time, I've been on all sides of corporate giving. As a consultant, advising clients on their philanthropic and sponsorship options, as the person responsible for finding and securing, securing that sponsorship, and also as a business owner myself, where I receive numerous requests for support. Ooh. Everybody see that? We're good to go? Okay. So the presentation is Arts Business Developing Strategies for Sponsorship how to position your organization to get the money and support you need from the business community. Okay. How do I make it go to the next slide? There we go. You start with an overview of the sector. I don't need to tell anybody here today how challenging it is to be in the development department of a not-for-profit arts organization. We are living this reality every day. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a massive impact on this culture, arts, entertainment, and recreation sectors, both globally and within Canada. Everything from venue closures, the cancellation of events, rescheduling, cancellation of festivals, performances, closing, reopening, operating restrictions, to the changing consumer preferences for physically distanced, at home, online, or hybrid events, have resulted in a very steep decline for our sector. In a blog post just timely released on November 7th, Imagine Canada reviewed priorities and challenges for nonprofits in the fourth quarter of 2022. First, the post discusses the lingering effects of COVID and what that has meant in particular for our already precarious healthcare system in Canada. There's a greater need for healthcare services as many treatments and surgeries were postponed over the last few years. This is also coupled with a shortage of healthcare workers and it's led to a crisis in emergency rooms and pediatric units. And this is very much uh, evident right now in just about every newscast we have seen over the last few months. In fact, in September, the new president of the Canadian Medical Association said the healthcare system was in crisis and faces collapse. The Post also surmises that governments will be under increasing pressure to solve the healthcare crisis by pouring more money into healthcare system, which may result in less money going to other needs. Read here, arts and culture. Post also says that inflation continues to be a major challenge for nonprofit organizations. Not only does it increase our operating costs, it also increases demand for services provided by many organizations and is likely to lead to a drop in donations. The Post also references a recent Angus, Angus Reid poll that found that 54% of Canadians have decreased their charitable giving in response to the rising costs of living. 54%, with 30% having decreased their giving a great deal. We all know that we're at the end of the year and this marks the holiday giving season and when many of us count in that bump for our annual donations. This downturn in charitable giving could have a major impact on many of our operations next year. So what does all this mean? There is an increased competition for funds. 
arts organizations are confronted by increased competitions for public and private funds, not only among other arts institutions, but also among a growing and more diversified field of new nonprofit organizations in the areas such as health, education, environment, religion, or other social causes. Here on the screen is a listing from um, Canada Helps of the categories. The pie is not getting any bigger and more people are coming to the table. There's 712 charities in Hamilton alone who are listed on Canada Helps. 53 are from arts and culture. Have you looked at the list? Do you know what they do and where your organization fits into the overall arts and cultural picture? Are you on this list? What does your impact page look like? Out of curiosity, I looked up the Art Gallery of Hamilton's page on Canada Helps. Little shame to reveal that our impact se uh, section is blank. The only thing there is supporting information, which shows that we spent a lot of money in 2016 on management and administration. Not really the best message to have right here. So in contrast, I looked at the Hamilton Arts Council page. Look, they have the impact there and all the different sections there. So needless to say, I'm adding Canada Helps page to my to-do list near the top of, I have to change this. This is the public face that's going out. I really have to make sure that, that our impact is there and figure out a way to get rid of the uh, 2016 data. Although I think that's automatically populated. Okay, so now what? Prior to the pandemic, the corporate giving landscape was already undergoing a shift. Uh, Imagine Canada had a report in 2018 on corporate giving. It's a community investment report on corporate giving that they released. And they were comparing a decade and the shift in a decade. They noted that strategic partnerships with select nonprofits are common, leading to fewer funds for the rest. In the survey that they did, 78% had at least one nonprofit that they continue to be a strategic partner with and most indicated that this was a growing priority. Of those with strategic partnerships, 42% indicated that they were funding fewer nonprofits to focus more resources on their signature partners. The report also noted a marked change in the field of corporate community investment from their prior report. In 2008, only 34% of companies with at least 500 employees had written policies to guide their giving compared to 95% of similarly sized respondents in 2018. Their research indicates that companies have become more strategically focused and sophisticated, and that is driving a wide range of changes in community investment practices. Donna? Yes. Would you just be able to um, uh, expand on the description of, of a strategic partner? What do we, what, what's the difference? A, a strategic partner, um, the way I see it, is somebody who you're, you're not just going at, uh, after to just have your name on something. You're working with them because it's enhancing something that your corporation is doing. So right. you're, it's, it's more of a relationship. It's more symbiotic. Um, you know, and it's, it's a whole trend that, that's been changing over the last 20 years in the field. Um, I think it might even be changing a little bit earlier than that. Um, anybody who's old enough remembers the days when Benson and Hedges used to sponsor the fireworks uh, displays at Ontario Place. And that was a great thing. And then all of a sudden there was, a, oh my gosh, um, we can't have cigarette companies. You know, so, so guess what happens? There's no more fireworks display. But they were doing that, you know, for brand awareness more than anything. So now there's a shift towards more maybe we want to get a little bit more something out of it. So I'll get, I'll get into that in, in a little bit, but it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting trend. Um, I think this trend is most likely to continue, uh, given the increased demands for funding in the not-for-profit sector and a growing emphasis on environmental and healthcare crises, which will no doubt limit the amount of corporate money available for arts and cultural organizations. So given all of this, what is the best approach for arts and cultural organization wins to, when it comes to securing corporate sponsorship? I would say that we have to be intentional in our efforts. So how do I do that? That's precisely the question. There are literally 
hundreds of sites on the internet offering you sage advice for how to secure the big corporate dollars. Top 10 strategies for luring, you know, corporations to you. Just do a simple Google search. You'll see them all. Most that I've come across are trying to sell you their product or their service. Here's the top 10 trends. And if you use our little service to organize them, uh, you're going to do much better. And, you know, stopping short of guaranteeing that you're going to get a gazillion dollars, our product will help you to do that. So it's been used, it's being used as a, tail, uh, a sales thing. A lot of people who advise and uh, make their living out of advising uh, not-for-profits how to make money um, are, are doing it with these, these little two-minute read blog posts. Um, I'm not selling you anything here today. I simply want to share with you what I've learned over my career. And more importantly, hopefully, I want to learn something from some of you today. We had a conversation at the beginning, David and I and um, Megan and Sheila, and David was talking about um, the working culture site, which majority of us already know for the job post. But David was talking about, oh, there's other stuff on there as well. And, and there's different information. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. I'm going to go have a look now and see what kind of resources they have as well. So I'm, I'm just grateful to have that little bit of information to add in. Personally, I'm always researching. I'm always learning and I'm always striving to be better at what I do. That said, the following are what I consider to be key considerations for engaging potential sponsors for financial and or in-kind support of your projects. Know your product. Know your market, do your research, select sponsors to approach, write your proposal, ask for support. Once you have their support, now what do you do? And then happily ever after. I'll go through these one by one. Know your product. Anyone working in fundraising and development in the arts should be the biggest cheerleader for their organization. After all, you're trying to get others to give their money or support. To be enthusiastic about your organization, you have to know what it does. For the Art Gallery of Hamilton, that means I need to know what's in the collection. What are the current and upcoming slate of exhibitions and programs? What do we offer? I do not have to be an expert in these areas, nor am I expected to be, but I do have to have the five minute elevator pitch about what the AGH is, why it's important, why you should come here and what we're offering. And I have to have that ready at all times because every opportunity that you have when you're out in the community, whether you're working um, or whether you're out personally is an opportunity for you to bring awareness to your organization. Awareness eventually hopefully brings support. Know your market. Companies receive hundreds of requests for their available dollars. So you need to tell the most compelling story about your organization that you can. To introduce your organization in the most meaningful way, you need to share statistics about the community you serve and data about the impact that your organization is making in that arena. Remember the impact page on Canada Helps? We need a little work. I, I would ask all of you to go look at your uh, impact page on Canada Helps and, and uh, see where you stand, see what the public is seeing when they're coming to research or to you look, look at you. Look at what other organizations in your community are saying and what they are doing. Have you done any evaluation studies of your programming? If yes, use this valuable data. If not, why not? How else are you going to measure your impact? Do your research. As you build your sponsorship program, it's crucial to research your prospective partners. Take the time to find potential partners that generally support your mission. Look at your past sponsors. Who are the sponsors that have supported you over the last three plus years? Which of them could support you in a deeper way? Have you asked? Asking is often you know, a very much overlooked area. Um, 
I do going out into the community now, when I was looking at sponsorship for our gala, the number of people who said, this is the first time we've ever been asked. First time we've been in the community mm -hmm. for a few years now, and this is the first time they've been asked. So often it's just, it's just asking worst that can happen. They say, no, which sponsors have you lost over the same period? Do you know why you lost them? And did you ask them why they no longer sponsor? Look to the greater arts sector um, in the community. Who are the players in your specific category? If you're a, um, an organization that it deals with, with music and, and live performance, who else does that? Who sponsors that? Who sponsors that in Hamilton? Who sponsors that in Ontario? Who sponsors that in Canada? Look to those as potential sponsors for your events programming. Understand why companies sponsor not-for-profit organizations. And this gets back to that strategic shift in um, no longer just putting out dollars to have that name recognition, but actually creating those strategic partnerships. There has been a great deal of research done in corporate sponsorship with numerous models created to explain why corporations engage in philanthropic giving. If you got a good 10 to 15 hours, there's some great references out there on the internet. You can go down this mire of this, this, these different models and they are fascinating. At its core though, uh, sponsorship is a business relationship and corporations will sponsor an event an exhibition or a program for a variety of reasons. For some, it's access to a specific audience that it wouldn't otherwise have access to and will hopefully generate leads for them. For others, it's brand awareness. Events and programs that align with your sponsor's values can help boost their brand. Some companies see it as a way to uh, boost their corporate social responsibility, the good corporate citizen. Creating or strengthening the, this positive image has the added benefit of creating the image of a successfully run company as well. Often we overlook the personal values of the CEO and the senior management team of a company because they can also be the motivating factor in the decision to support the arts. In my private uh, consulting practice that I have with Cultural Asset Management Group, it was very much driven by myself and um, the, the senior management team over who we would support because who we believed in. And we did sponsor, but we sponsored selectively. Um, for some CEOs, there may be a moral, a moral obligation to support the local community. Uh, they might get personal satisfaction with helping or they might have a uh, personal desire to have contact with creative entities. Uh, some of you may not even thought about corporate sponsorship yet. Maybe you think that you're not big enough to attract corporate attention. But without corporate sponsorship, most organizations may survive, but they may not develop enough to thrive. So how does one move from merely surviving to thriving? You have to realize and understand the valuable role that arts and cultural organizations play in the economic life of a community. The arts attract people, which in turn attract business and help maintain a robust, thriving community. This is exactly what the downtown revitalization process in Hamilton is all about. A younger, educated and talented workforce like to live in areas where they can have a greater quality of life. Guess what? The arts are a major part of enriching that quality. So a vibrant arts scene is of paramount importance. importance. Smart businesses know this and use it to their advantage. So who already thinks you're part of their value proposition? Well, looking at the uh, 75 James Condo project, apparently the Art Gallery of Hamilton is a nice selling feature. Even more so, the modern downtown Hamilton, there's a picture of us in there. How many builders, developers, um, other businesses in Hamilton are already using your organization to sell themselves? Have a look. Trick is now converting that into 
in, in, into a sponsorship, into a, um, a more of a relationship. So modern's on my list. As with all, if you look around in the downtown core, I'm, uh, there's buildings going up all over the place. The development is happening. How many of those people have even been approached by Orts Organization for some sort of sponsorship, some sort of awareness campaign, um, something like that? We have our Giving Tuesday group coming up on um, November 29th. Arts organizations are coming together to showcase what they do. We're going to continue that discussion with, with a broader group, and it's an open group. So anybody who is a not-for-profit in the arts serving the Hamilton community is welcome to, to join us for that ongoing discussion. One of the things I'm going to bring to that meeting afterwards is what are we doing collectively to let the new people who are moving into these buildings know what is available to them in arts and culture? Is there a package we can put together so every resident can go in there? And I say collectively, it'd be really easy for me to just go, yeah, AGH, I'm just going to make sure that everybody's got our information. That's very self-serving and may help, but I truly believe that we are stronger as a community when we work together, when we band together to just say, hey, Hamilton has this. I was at the art fair in Hamilton, manning the Art Gallery of Hamilton's booth a couple of weeks ago. Um, number of people who never even heard of the Art Gallery of Hamilton's, a little disappointing, but it was an opportunity to, to educate there. And also the number of people told me, oh my gosh, I heard there's such a great art scene in Hamilton. Nobody could really give specifics. It was just that kind of, there's a great art scene in Hamilton, great arts and cultural scene in Hamilton. We need to capitalize on this and we need to do that together. But a vibrant art scene requires that funding and support. And this is where the arts and the business world working together to build communities and to help one another will help a community thrive. It's good business to support the arts. Remember this when you're crafting your pitches. And we get to write your proposal. Sponsorship is a two-way exchange. There should be a balance of equal benefits for business and for arts organizations. Big corporations make large contributions for special events and programs, especially when they expect to receive high visibility for a blockbuster show. Don't we wish we could all do that? Most of us, however, will be lucky to see one such blockbuster in a five-year period, if at all let alone annually. Not many of us can pull over, uh, off the nutcracker that the National Ballet can do every year. And that's, we call it here nutcrackers. We need our nutcracker because that is what attracts people. That's what brings them in. Not many of us are able to do that on an annual basis. That doesn't mean, however, that you can't attract sponsorship at a high level. You just have to be strategic about your approach. One of the keys that I found to attracting the best sponsor for your event or your program, your exhibition, is to fully understand what your program goals are. Know what you want out of a sponsorship and get really clear on how your program, event, exhibition provides value to potential sponsors. Remember that at its core, sponsorship is a business relationship and companies will sponsor your event for a variety of reasons. You need to understand your value proposition. Ask yourself why a particular business would want to fund your organization. What's in it for them? And this is where your sponsorship proposal comes into play. In your proposal, paint a compelling picture. Tell your unique story. Does your organization have humble beginnings? Was it founded as a grassroots initiative for the local community? Talk about the community that you serve and use data to show the impact that your organization is make, making in that area. Get personal. Data, of course, is absolutely necessary, but should never, ever be used on its own. Highlight a specific success story or two or three, a personal story that drives home your organization's impact. I was watching a TED Talk a couple months ago about marketing and awareness. And it had a story about a dental office. And it said that, you know, nine out of the 10 dentist's office had the same, you know, 
picture of teeth, you know, that, that fake teeth with the toothbrush beside it and, and saying, you know, come here and we'll make your smile great. One dental office that was new came in with a story about a woman whose life was transformed because of the care she received from them. Guess who ended up getting a lot of business? It's, it's, it's not surprising because it's that personal relationship that you have that outreach to the community to say, oh my gosh, yes, that's me. I can relate. Use that. You're seeing it a lot in advertisements for, for other not-for-profits. Use what's happening in the broader sector to create those stories. Um, it may be possible to have an emotional connection which strikes a chord with the sponsoring company. Because don't forget, they are corporations because there's people within that corporation who make those decisions. The more a company understands about your nonprofit, the more they can assess if your organization aligns with their own corporate values. Describe what you do. What's your mission statement? How does your company live up to it on a daily business? And what are your values? Describe your audience demographics. It's best if you target market um, if it's best if your target market matches the potential sponsors. That way, they know they are reaching the right audience by contributing to your event or program. If a sponsor that you're thinking about is really concerned with, um, you know, one issue such as such as healthcare or or wellness, maybe it's not the best sponsor for your live performance, but maybe there's some another program that you're doing that aligns with it. So make sure you're approaching the right people for the right program. Be specific about your funding need. Don't beat around the bush. Break down what the financing will go to, such as whether it's venue costs, food, bringing in guest speakers, so forth. You wanna select the sponsors to approach. Once you have your proposal document ready to go, it's time to start looking for some specific sponsors. If a sponsor is not a good match for you, as I mentioned, it's not going to be easy to get them to invest in your organization. That's why it's crucial to spend some time determining what your program or event is about, including who your target audience is and how your event will connect to what they're trying to accomplish with their sponsorship dollars. You could start by finding companies within your program or event's niche whether that's an exhibition, a performance, a wellness workshop, look for companies that are connected to your event, even in a tangential way. So a piano manufacturer, for instance, may have an interest in supporting a performance or a series of performances, especially if one of their piano models is used. Look to what you're already doing, who are you already using for your things, and look to who supplies that, who meets that need in the market. You might not get a financial contribution, but you might get an in-kind one, which at the, at the end of the day goes to support your bottom line and reduce uh, your overall operating expenses. It's a good notion. The penny saved is a penny earned here. Uh, next, you might want to look at your selected potential, uh, at potential sponsors that you've identified who have sponsored you before. Um, have a look at business news, pay attention to what's going on, read the newspaper for information about what companies are doing and where their marketing direction is taking them. How are they communicating with their audience? See if there's any way that you can somehow come at it from a different angle. And you can use this research that you, uh, that you gather to tell you, tell you your pitch to their individual interests. Uh, one thing that I should point, however, is that not all sponsorships are created equal. There are some sponsorships that are problematic. A timely example of this is the partnership between the National Portrait Gallery in London, England and BP, which is coming to an end in December of this year. For 30 years, BP sponsored the gallery's annual portrait award. The award will go ahead in 2023 without BP support, although it's not quite clear where that new support is coming from. The Royal Shakespeare Company and BP ended their partnership in 2019, while BP and the Tate cut ties in 2017. BP, however, still sponsors the British Museum and the Royal Opera House. In July of this year, a spokesperson for the British Museum said, 
The British Museum receives funding from BP, a long-standing corporate partner to support the museum's mission, providing public benefit for a global audience. Without external support, much programming and other major projects would not happen. True, but how long are they going to be able to continue receiving this money in light of um, protests that are happening? In 2019, the Turner Prize and to, uh, ended a sponsorship deal with Stagecoach Southeast a day after it was announced. Imagine all the work going into securing the sponsorship. It comes out day later, boom, it's all over. And it was mutually, um, mu mutually dissolved. Apparently, the chairman of Stagecoach Group, Sir Brian uh, Souter, had backed a failed campaign 19 years ago to keep Section 28, which was a law banning teachers teaching gay rights in schools. When the sponsorship was announced, this information came to light, sparking a wave of criticism, which led to the cancellation of the sponsorship deal. At that point, it's too late to find another sponsor and damage has already been done to your organization. Another recent art sponsorship controversy happened with the Sackler Trust, who suspended new charitable donations in the United Kingdom in 2019, amid claims that the Sackler family fortune was linked to US company Purdue Pharma. Of course, their opioid uh, painkiller OxyContin is responsible for a lot of the um, opioid overdoses and deaths worldwide. Uh, the announcement followed the National Portrait Gallery and the Tate rejecting donations from the trust. We're not immune to this in Hamilton. Our current exhibition, The Bigger Picture, has a timeline and we encourage people to draw or write comments in chalk on the wall. Recently, someone wrote, no art on a dead planet, RBC supports pipelines. RBC just happens to be one of our major sponsors. Apparently, direct uh, sponsorship from oil and gas pipeline companies and those associated with them is not even a prerequisite for controversy, as a recent protest at the Vancouver Art Gallery sh has shown. Just a couple of days ago, November 12th, climate activists threw maple syrup on an Emily Carr painting to draw attention to the global climate emergency. This group is demanding an end to the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline project currently under construction in BC. The Art Gallery of, of Vancouver does not have sponsorship from the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, but they are using it to gain attention. Uh, one of the protesters was quoted by the CBC as saying, I think any amount of publicity we can get as an organization is worth it because the climate crisis is the most pressing pressing crisis of our time. All this to say is our jobs have just become a little bit more difficult securing sponsorship at a higher level. The ask, ask for support. Once you have identified potential sponsors, you'll need to tailor your proposal for each company that you approach. The bulk of your work will already have been done, however, so hopefully you're just tweaking the proposal to more closely align with individual company stated goals or values. For existing sponsors, the best approach is most likely to be a telephone call. Hopefully you've been in touch with them since you last asked for support. For new sponsors, there's a number of, way to kick, a number of ways to kick off a new relationship with a potential sponsor. Do you have any connections to the company that you want to approach? Hopefully they can direct you to the right person to talk to. Work closely with your executive director and your board. Maybe they have personal contacts in the company and can arrange an introduction. Maybe somebody on your staff knows somebody who works there. Do you know who makes the decisions around funding in the company? Companies often have a link on their websites about their charitable giving, so that's a good place to start. Then there's the cold introduction. This is where email is probably your best tool. Um, and for a cold introduction email, you really need to choose your words very carefully to give potential sponsors a reason to open your email. This starts with your subject line, which should give the recipient context for why you're reaching out to them. And use the email to briefly mention any mutual or personal connections that you may have, explain why you're contacting them, 
your need for support and why you think that a partnership between your organization would be mutually beneficial. Include a brief overview of the program that you want sponsorship for and ask for a meeting. You're not gonna sell them on the email itself. You want that face-to-face -face meeting, if possible, or at least a telephone call to go over specifics. At this stage, I would not include a full-blown sponsorship package as you may scare them off. They may not be able to afford the gold or platinum level, but could provide lower level or in-kind support. Don't put them in a potentially embarrassing position where they have to turn you down because of their own financial picture. This is especially true for some of the smaller companies that you will be asking for support. Offer, maybe it's your first contact, offer to have them visit for a behind the scenes tour. Say that you're interested in their corporation, their values align with you. You just, you're not even asking them for anything. You just wanna bring them over, have a visit, I personally like to give out our free admission passes to potential sponsors and invite them to events at the gallery. By the way, we're doing our very popular vinyl night this Thursday. So if any of you have not been, it's a great time to come out Thursday night. Our artist in our RBC artist in residence, Nathan Eugene Carson, is there activating the space. Bring your own vinyl. It's a fabulous night. So I invite you all to come and attend and there's no charge. So I'd like to invite potential sponsors to just come and see what we're all about. Because once they're here and they see what we're doing, they'll get it. They'll go, oh my gosh, I wanna be a part of this. How can I support? How can I be involved? How can my company be involved? Remember that sponsorship is a business relationship. The better you can build connections with your potential sponsors and establish trust, the more valuable your organization will become. If you're fortunate enough to secure a face-to-face -face meeting or a call, one of the first things that you want to do is ask them what their corporate goals are for the year. Most companies have annual goals and objectives that they're trying to reach. Look for any synergies between your organizations. If you can identify what a company is committed to, you can better, better identify how helping your organization can help them achieve both your goals and their goals. Show them a variety of options. Be very strategic in your ask. When submitting individual programs for sponsorship, make sure you don't inadvertently shoot yourself in the foot. You may get a positive response for a lower level project, but your partner may be capable of sponsoring at a much higher level. Maybe they'll sponsor multiple projects. This is kind of risky because after all, if you've given them the sponsorship at the low level and they've agreed, they can already say that they're a sponsor of your organization without having to give that higher amount. And you've lost the opportunity to ask for it. In some cases, you may want to consider approaching certain sponsors with a whole range of or series of programs rather than on a one-off basis. If possible, have an outline of your event calendar for the year and share all the possible options with your potential partner at one time. This avoids any potential limit to what your attendant partner will choose to sponsor. And this is why you need to know what's going on in your organization. You need to be able to say, wow, I've seen this. We want sponsorship for this, but this is actually a series event that I think your organization will fit more, uh, more closely align with this and give you A, B, C, D, E, whatever it is that they're hoping to accomplish. So, once you get your support, now what do you do? Well, you deliver as promised. Now that you've secured the sponsorship, it's vital to properly execute on the agreement that has just been made. Not fulfilling sponsorship expectations is the surest way to lose corporate support, and it's far easier to renew a happy sponsor than it is to seek out new sponsors year after year. The very first two calls that I made here at the AGO, without a lie, the first two calls I made were apologies to sponsors who didn't receive the benefits that they had been promised in exchange for the money that they gave. I remedied the situation, smoothed everything over. They were very happy, but I've yet to secure additional sponsorship from either of them for subsequent events. Unfortunately, the damage was already done. Relationship maintenance or stewardship. So sponsors are your partners and your partners need care and attention to keep their support. 
and to feel that you truly value them. Don't chase the check by reaching out only when you need something from them. It's important to think of sponsorship work in terms of sponsorship development. This means you need to develop a plan for a year round contact with your sponsors. Share your success stories with them. Send out a holiday card, share articles or events with your contacts and just check in with them periodically throughout the year. Time passes very quickly. So make sure you take the time to map out what your communication plan is for the year and follow it. Remember that the vast majority of your annual corporate revenue will come from partners that already know and love your organization. It's where we get to happily ever after. This is your in-between projects, your downtime, although I've yet to see any real downtime because you should be working on your next cycle. Continue to do your research. Set up meetings with potential future sponsorships to discuss their interests, their philanthropic goals. You don't have to ask them for anything, just to show them what you're all about, invite them to events, throw in some free tickets, get, uh, get them to you. Use social media to share some love to the sponsors that you already have. Perhaps one of the most important tactics of sponsorship, however, is reporting. If you're not reporting to all of your partners the value they experienced in partnering you, do it now, do it immediately. Show that impact that they have had because they can now share it and tweet out about it and show it to their shareholders, show it to their senior management that, oh my gosh, this sponsorship, this money that we gave to a X organization has resulted in this for us. Reporting doesn't have to be extensive. It just has to be deliberate. Show your impact. Sponsors like to know that their sponsorship means something. So it's important to let them know that the impact accomplished from the event or program that they sponsored. How many children were able to participate in the program? How many members of the community did you reach? Even if it's a small amount, don't focus on, well, it only really had impact for five students. It had an enormous impact on these students who, again, personal story, transformation. Doesn't matter if it's one, it's five, it's 500. You get that personal connection and you show it. And this wouldn't have happened without your support. This follow-up allows your corporate partners to become more connected to your cause, which will hopefully help them to become an advocate for you in the long run. Express gratitude. Last but not least, don't forget to say thank you. It may seem obvious, but when talking to sponsors, many, and, and I've had this too, sponsoring events where I've given money and sponsored events and never heard boo or a thank you after the initial, oh, great, cash the check, on we go, see you next year. Yeah, I'm a little less likely to sponsor you the next year if you didn't make the effort to just say, wow, really, really appreciated that. And it doesn't take a lot. Your, you, your whole team, you may be one person, you may be the executive director, the fundraiser, the event organizer, whatever. Take that time to just send a thank you note or a phone call or something um, just, to, just to show that love, to, to build that relationship. It's part of your ongoing relationship development. And that simple gesture is one of the most important things in maintaining that existing relationship. So make the time. So thank you. That's all that I have for you today. But I'm hoping that, that it stirred some sort of um, conversation, some sort of questions, um, uh, provided you a little bit of something that maybe you didn't think of. And perhaps maybe um, some of you can share now any questions that you have, any feedback, any ideas that, that maybe all of us can benefit from.